anniversary of the 1967 Newark Rebellion, which some people call the 1967 Newark Riot. It was a seminal event in the history of the city of Newark. It shaped Newark's contemporary history. I mean, it's almost like AD and BC. It's like before the rebellion and after the rebellion. As a result of the 1967 rebellion, Newark elected its first African-American mayor, Ken Gibson, and has had African-American mayors ever since. And uh, shortly thereafter, four years after the election, Ken Gibson, it finally got a majority on the Newark City Council. But one of the reasons that the People's Organization for Progress for the past 30 years has been having these annual observances of the Newark Rebellion is that we try to draw out the lesson of the rebellion for our times, and that is this. The Newark Rebellion was triggered by an act of police brutality. The arrest and the beating of John Smith, a black cab driver, he was arrested just four blocks from here at Fairmount and Springfield Avenue. And he was beaten by the police. Many people thought he had been killed. He was taken to the 17th Precinct, 17th Avenue Precinct, which is just two blocks from here. And that precinct had a terrible reputation. People had died in that precinct and many people thought that he had, he was dead and so there were several organizations that called the demonstration in front of the police precinct including the Congress of Racial Equality, the Newark chapter that was here and that demonstration erupted into a confrontation between the police and the demonstrators and that erupted into the 1967 Newark Rebellion one of the most intense uprisings during the 60s. Many people don't know that there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in the United States between 1960 and 1972. That's a little known fact. In 1960 alone, nearly 150 of those rebellions occurred. And in the following year, 1968, after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, some 165 of those uprisings occurred including the one in Detroit that was just a couple of weeks, about a month after the uh, eruption in Newark. During the Newark Rebellion, uh, thousands of people were arrested, hundreds of people were injured, um, 26 people were killed, the 1,600 member Newark police force couldn't stop it, they called in 700 state troopers, that combined force couldn't stop it, finally they called in 3,000 National Guard and a state of emergency martial law was declared in the state of Newark uh, for, for almost a week. I was um, old enough to see and understand what was going on uh, at that time. So, during all the uprisings that occurred in the decade of the 60s and the years that followed, almost every one of them was caused by an incident of police brutality just like the 1967 rebellion. And that's the lesson that we draw out for today, that as long as these horrific incidents of police brutality 
continue to occur, we'll continue to have these disturbances, these uprisings, these rebellions, just as we did two years ago in Ferguson, just as we did a year ago in Baltimore. There will be more until state governments and the federal government takes the strong and uncompromising action that's needed to stop police brutality. As long as they let the murder of unarmed black people continue by police, people, there's going to be an outcry from the people. Now, do you feel like rallying is enough to send the message around the country? Do you feel like we need to do more, you as an organization that's trying to end No, rallying is not enough, but we need to do more of it. There need to be demonstrations every day, everywhere in the United States of America. I wish we could have 381 days of demonstrations, just like Dr. King had the 381 day Montgomery bus boycott. We need to use every tactic imaginable and tactics that haven't yet been imagined to make this point. But one thing is clear, the outcry is not strong enough yet. Every community, and this is not just a black people's issue, everybody that wants justice, every community where people want justice, they should be mobilizing, organizing in the streets, making their righteous indignation known, and then also making it felt at the ballot box, and also using their dollars not to support any economic institutions that profit from our oppression. So we must use every tactic, but among all the tactics, organizing, mobilizing, protesting, marching, demonstration, very important. And they must continue, and they must grow in number and intensity. Why, why would you say, why would you say riot would be the wrong word to use? Well, riot, riot is something that, that really is something that happens after a soccer game or after a football game, a confrontation that happens, you know, in, with, between rival uh, gangs and, and so forth. These were rebellions that happened in the 1960s. They were collective responses to the historical oppression that black people experienced up until that time and continue to experience today. The irony is that many of the conditions that made the ground fertile for the uprisings of the 1960s still exist today. In fact, there are twice as many poor people in this country today as there were in 1967. Their twi black unemployment is twice white unemployment. Black wealth, the wealth of black families is but a fraction of the wealth of white families. The racial, many of the racial disparities that exist when the Kerner Commission report was issued not only still exist, but in fact have grown worse. And one can only conclude that there will be similar responses to these similarly existing conditions. Do you want to talk at all about the police oversight committee, Larry, as, as a step forward here in Newark, at least one step forward yes. possibly? Yes. The establishment of the Newark Police Review Board is a historical step here in Newark. It's the first time in the 350 year history of Newark that such a review board has been established. And we have to give credit to Mayor Ross Baraka for that. Uh, he went ahead to establish the board and initially did it through executive order. And then a year later, it was followed by a municipal ordinance passed by the city council. Now, the establishment of the review board is being challenged by the police unions in the courts and with the state of New Jersey. But nonetheless, it's a step in the right direction. But we have to point out that this was brought about as a result of a Justice Department investigation that came about as a result of the massive complaints and demonstrations and protests that were held over the years by people here in Newark, including our organization, the People's Organization for Progress. The result of that three year Justice Department investigation was that they found that 90% of the stops that the Newark police were making were unconstitutional, unconstitutional. 
that 85% of those people were black and therefore the police were engaging in racial discrimination. They did find that the Newark police engaged in the use of excessive force and more than that, they found that the drug and gang units of the Newark police were involved in criminal activity. There were many recommendations that came out of that report, but the upshot is that the Justice Department called for the federal takeover of the Newark Police Department, called for a consent decree to be hammered out between the Justice Department and the city of Newark to reform the Newark Police Department, and most importantly, a federal monitor will be placed over the Newark Police Department, and I believe he's been chosen, his name is Peter Harvey, and he's the former state attorney general for New Jersey. This is a step in the right direction, and it is the fruit of the people's struggle here in the city of Newark to get justice. But at the same time, we must say that many cities throughout the country have police review boards. In fact, New York City has a police review board. And some of the most horrific, act, uh, horrific incidents of police brutality have been occurred in places where police review boards have existed for years. So while we support the police review board here in North, People's Organization for Progress has a representative on the police review board. We say that the strongest antidote to police brutality is people organized and mobilized to fight police brutality. Power to the people. Power to the people. I'm so glad to see everybody out today for what is the 49th anniversary of the 1967 Newark Rebellion, which Carlos, the People's Organization for Progress, has been celebrating for the 33 years that we have been in existence from the very year that our organization was founded we had observances of the 1967 rebellion. And before this monument was erected and initiated, I believe, by Councilman George Branch, former councilman of the Central Ward, we used to do what was called a Black Liberation March through the Central Ward, going to those important places in the history of the 1967 Newark Rebellion. So we're here today, brothers and sisters, once again, to observe what we believe to be the seminal event in contemporary Newark history. I mean, everybody who lived through that has a consciousness that is a essentially split in half before the rebellion and after the rebellion. And we note that there are some who are here in this circle today who were alive and in, who lived through the 1967 Newark Rebellion. Between 1960 and 1972, there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in the United States of America. That's a little known fact. People think there were a handful of uprisings. There were more than a thousand, and they lasted well past 1967. In fact, one of the last rebellions to take place was in Camden, New Jersey in 1971. And in fact, right here in the state of New Jersey, almost every major city had an uprising. And Newark was not the first. I believe the first was Jersey City. And that was in 1965 or 1966. There was an uprising in Jersey City. And what was the common denominator? What is the connecting event of all of these rebellions? Each one of these rebellions was sparked by an incident of police brutality here in Newark just maybe four blocks up Springfield Avenue. The Newark police arrested a black cab driver named John Smith, and they beat Mr. Smith. And they took Mr. Smith just maybe 
two blocks away to what's called the West District Precinct. Now they used to call it the 17th Avenue Precinct. And that precinct had a terrible reputation. People died in that precinct. And when they took John Smith in that precinct, many people thought he was dead. And so people came together. There had been a number of organizations active in Newark, New Jersey. Newark has a long history in the civil rights movement and in the black power movement. In fact, you could say Newark was one of the epicenters of the black power movement. So there were many active organizations at that time. One of those was the Congress, the Newark chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality. There was a fellow from Newark who passed recently named Bob Kerbin. He was the head of that chapter. And he was one of those that called a demonstration in front of the West District Precinct in response to the arrest of John Smith. Well, it didn't take long for a confrontation because the police attacked the demonstrators. And that confrontation between the police and the demonstrators led to what was called the Newark riots, what we call the Newark Rebellion. And one of the reasons it was a rebellion was because the demography of this community was much different than that it is now. There's been some ethnic cleansing going on here in Newark, New Jersey. And there was, in fact, at one time, Newark had more black people per, per square mile than any other city in the country. And one of the reasons for that was because of the public housing projects, many of which existed here in the Central Ward. Each of them had a population larger than some town. And right over here was Hayes Home. The West District Precinct was next to Hayes Home. And then right over there was Stella Wright. And then there, below that was Scudder Home. There were many housing projects. And so there was a tight community here and it didn't take long for the word to spread about the arrest and the beating of John Smith. And it didn't take long for that demonstration to occur. But that demonstration erupted into the Newark Rebellion. And we have to say clearly why we call it a rebellion. A riot is something that happens after a soccer game or after a basketball game, you know, between gangs and things, you know, spontaneous uh, eruptions. The 1967 uprising in Newark was a rebellion because it was a collective response to the oppression that black people lived through at that time. And we, it's called a rebellion because we would say a riot if there only had been a handful of them. There were thousands of them, all for the same reason. And one of the hallmarks that distinguishes a rebellion but from a riot is how those in power respond to it. When you have a rebellion, you have to do what? You have to put it down. And what do you use to put it down? You use military might to put it down. That's how you know you have a rebellion. Newark had a 1,300 member police force at that time, could not put down the rebellion. They had to call in 700 state troopers. Those combined forces could not put down the rebellion. They had to call in 3,000 National Guard and declare martial law. That's how you know you have a rebellion. That's how you know you have a rebellion, when you have to use martial forces to subdue civil forces, then you know you have a rebellion. And that's what was here. And it was a, a very, it was a cataclysmic event. Hundreds of people were wounded, hundreds of people were arrested, 26 people were killed. And initially they said these 26 whose names are here now were killed by snipers. They said there's a sniper over there. But when they did autopsies on the people who were killed, what did they find? They found National Guard bullets, they found state trooper bullets, and they found local police bullets. And no one has ever been in the 49-year history of this city 
no one has been indicted or held accountable for the death of these people in 1967. In fact, there's a book that was written just about four years after, three years after the rebellion called No Cause for Indictment by Ron Parambo, which examined the whole criminal justice process that took place, or I should say lack of criminal justice that took place in 1967. So out of that rebellion came a tremendous movement for self-determination here in the city of Newark. Newark was an apartheid city. It was a predominantly black city controlled by a white minority elite. That was the reality of Newark. In fact, this boulevard here, which at one time was called Belmont Avenue, is now called Irvine Turner Boulevard, named after the first black representative to the Newark City Council who was elected in 1960. So this was a predominantly black city, but there was only one black representative in 1960 on the city council, and that was Irvine Turner. So black people rose up. They had a movement to elect the first black mayor. Ken Gibson ran the year before the rebellion in 1966. He didn't succeed. But then out of that experience came an organization called the United Brothers. And the United Brothers eventually involved into the Committee for a Unified Newark. And the Committee for a Unified Newark helped to pull together a broad coalition of forces that eventually was able one, to hold important political conventions, to galvanize the political power of black people in this city. There was a black political convention held in 1968 right here, you can see the building, at West Kenny Junior High School. And in 1969, there was a black and Puerto Rican convention that was held at the school that's on Clinton Place, now it's called University High. It used to be called Clinton Place Junior High School. That's where the Black and Puerto Rican Convention was held. And out of that convention came the Community Choice Team. That's what it was called. It was Ken Gibson for mayor, Sharp James for South Ward Councilman, Dennis Westbrook for Central Ward Councilman, and there were others on that team. Unfortunately, they did not get elected in 1970. But Gibson was elected in 1970 and thus the city has had black political control since then. But that would not have happened had not black people risen up in, 19, seven, in 1967. And folks rose up, not just because of police brutality, but where the University of Medicine and Dentistry is now used to be a whole black community. Why did they choose over there to build the medical school because Mayor Adonisio, who was white, wanted to reduce the voting power of the black population here in the Central Ward. Initially, they wanted five acres cleared. They only ended up with an acre and a half cleared to build the University of Medicine and Dentistry, but it essentially resulted in the depopulation of that area over there. So there was a controversy surrounding the building of the medical school. There was always a controversy surrounding the public schools in Newark. There was a fellow named Wilbur Parker. He was the first black certified public accountant in the history of New Jersey, and he was up for the job of secretary for the Board of Education, and they denied it. And that was another thing that outraged folks because the Newark public schools had been predominantly black for a number of years prior to the rebellion. So we're here today, brothers and sisters, to commemorate those who died, but also to apply the lessons of 1967 to what's going on today. And what is the major, there are many lessons, but what is the major lesson? The major lesson is this, a thousand uprisings between 1960 and 1972, including the rebellion in 1967, all sparked by incidents of police brutality, all sparked by, poli by police brutality. And even since then, what have we seen? Uprisings in Los Angeles because of the beating of Rodney King. Uprisings in Ferguson because of the murder of Michael Brown. 
uprising in Baltimore because of the murder of Freddie Gray. And as long as this unjust murder and terror and violation of our rights continue, we will continue to resist and we will continue to fight back. And that's the great lesson that is drawn for today. So right now, let us stop. Let us have, what's your name, honey? Destiny Shell. Destiny Shell? Destiny. Destiny Shell. Destiny is going to come now. She's going to lay the flowers at the monument, lay it right in front, right there at the monument. Turn around so people can see. Turn around. Hold the flowers. Hold the flowers. Turn around. Very good. Give a big hand. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let us have a moment of silence for those who perished in the rebellion in 1967. Power to the people. As is our custom, we try to uh, give an opportunity for those. Are there any folks here who lost their loved ones during the rebellion? Are there any relatives here of the people? Yes. Come on over and say who you are and say, but, but before you start, let me just read the names of all the people who are here on the monument. Rose Abraham, Elizabeth Artis, Tedok Bell, Leroy Boyd, Rebecca Brown, Mary Helen Campbell, Rufus Council, William Furr, Hetty Gaines, Raymond Gilmore, Isaac Harrison, Rufus Hawk, Oscar Hill, Jesse Mae Jones, Robert Martin, Albert Messier, Captain Michael Moran, Eddie Moss, Cornelius Murray, Michael Pugh, James Rutledge, Victor Lewis Smith, James Sanders, Eloise Spellman, Richard Talaferro, and Detective Fred Toto. Those are the names that are on this monument and once again I want to thank Councilman George Branch, the former Councilman of the Central Ward of Newark for taking the initiative. The monument reads, dedicated by the residents of the City of Newark, July 11, 1997. And so, introduce yourself and who your relative is. Uh, my name is Al Green. Uh, Albert Messier is my brother. Um, he was he was uh, killed in the riots the year before I was born. And uh, from my knowledge, I, you know, it, it kind of devastated the family. Uh, my father especially took a toll on him. And, uh, he was gone back as a child, almost 50 years. Um, you can see the hurt. You know what I'm saying? He went through a lot. You know what I'm saying? And uh, he lost a lot. You know, sometimes you gotta lose a little bit to get where you need to be. And um, our relationship got better. But, you know, he was taken from me once he got, you know, I guess, um, with peace. You know, so, um, you know, finally found a witness, you know, to, to what happened. Um, it was on Facebook, thanks to social media. You can find out a lot of stuff. Wow. And um, he explained to me what happened. And um, I'm from the neighborhood, so, you know, I went out there and I just pictured myself, you know, uh, how I went down as opposed to how I was told. And um, I was like, 
you know, this, this thing is futile. I mean, it's like it's not going to never end. You know, like, for what? You know, it's got to stop. You know, it's, it's devastating communities. It's devastating people. It's causing a great divide, not only within the country, the neighborhoods, you know, uh, what you gonna teach your kids? You know, they, they see this stuff now. It's more, it's more so when you're 10, 11 years old when I was coming up, compared to now, you got social media. So everything is exposed, you know, and you're not gonna start asking questions, you know, and somewhere along the line, somebody's got to tell the truth, you know, and they gotta start telling the truth, you know. We gotta pull together, we gotta do better than this. You know, um, violence ain't the way, but Sometimes you, you you know you back yourself in the corner. What's what's left? You know, which how you going? You want to live or you want to die? You know, you just can't lay down and just take it. And we've been taking it for 400 years. You know, enough is enough. You got to start treating people such as if you want respect, you got to give it. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy, man. You know, and it starts with us. It ends with us. So, I mean, I hope we get together. You know what I'm saying? So, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Green. Hello, my name is Tawana Hutchins. And um, Eloise Spellman, she was my, my niece, great-grandmother. She was the one that supposed to be a sniper shot. She had 11 children at the time. In Hayes' home, she was closing up her windows, and she was killed. I, um, I really didn't know her because I was like a year old. But my, my brother married her daughter, and like, I learned a lot about her, her good things about her. She had 11 children, you know. Um, a lot of them succeeded in life. Like uh, one of her sons, he took his life because he couldn't deal with his mother's death. And another daughter, she turned to, you know, alcohol and stuff like that because she couldn't deal with her mother's death either, you know. And like, I just pray to God that we as a community come together because it's bad for us. We're the only community that can take a gun and kill a guy that you grew up with next door, you know, and it's sad. Like, I got two babies here, you know, which I love to death and I told them everything that I know about Eloise Spillman. She was a very decent mother, that left 11 children at a very young age. Know, and it was it was just so sad. I really don't know that much about her, only what her daughter tell me about her. But the family, majority of them have been successful. We did a documentary uh, 20 years after the rocket, and um, so it happens I was in it. Me and my mother, she's 90 now. Thank God she still she's still here. And um, um, it was really sad because like. It just, it just hurt, you know. I was only a year old when I ran, you know. But I read a lot. Reading is fundamental. Kids should read. Read, read, read. Every day, take at least a half an hour a day to read, you know. And get your education. Because without your education, you you have nothing. Nothing. We got to get out. We got to teach, teach our children. Keep them in school, you know. I mean, some of us fell. But God is good all the time. You pick yourself back up. And our children are our future. Our children are our future. That's all we got. You know, and that's all I got to say. Thank God and bless everybody that's here today. Yeah, yeah, all right. Beautiful, beautiful. Are there any relatives, any other relatives here of uh, those who died in the rebellion? Any other relatives? Going on? All right, are there any... Oh, first of all, I want to say, want to point out that this area has been beautified here. It had fallen into a bad state, but uh, Sister Sandra Hayward and the Popcorn Kids, which is a youth division of the People's Organization for Progress or Youth Affiliate, they beautified this place, and this is the second time they planted the flowers, so give the Popcorn Kids a big hand, and their mentors, Brother Zaid and Sister Sandra and all the folks that work with the Popcorn Kids. Are there any Newark residents who were in Newark at the time of the rebellion? In Newark that want to speak? Douglas Tucker and then yourself. Am I behind? 
I was 13 years old during the North 67 North Rebellion. I live in the North Ward. As some of you may know, it was called um, it was called a North Ward. But it was, what's that white man's name? And Tony Imperial was the mayor of the North Ward. In 1967, I went to the school stadium. I climbed the fence to look at the National Guard and the police. And one of the National Guard said to me, get down from there, you in, or you be a dead end. I got down from the fence. I ran home faster than Bob Hayes. And I stayed in my house. And in 67, there was an 8 o'clock curfew. And I lived next to a bar called Reggie's Bar. And the policeman broke the glass of Reggie's Bar because he had a sign out on his glass that said, Reggie's Bar belonged to a brother. They smashed his glass. But I'm glad to see everybody's here. All the relatives the friends of relatives. And I want to say one more thing. John Smith was a taxi cab driver. He was stopped in the Central War by two white racist police officers. They beat John Smith outside his taxi cab, brought him to the precinct and beat him to death. They, they, he did not, they beat him. And the people in the building saw the white police officer drag John Smith into the precinct and that's when they started throwing things at the policemen. That's when the 67 No Rebellion started. Thank you. In my hand, Douglas Tucker. Who else? Our brother here. Everybody come introduce yourself. I'm Glenn Drummer and I was three years old when the rebellion was, and my mother, lived, we lived on High, High and Spruce Street at the time, and I was three at the time, and my mother, she worked in um, Short Hills for the rich Jews, and she also worked in Harry's um, department store that was down on Springfield Avenue, and the day that the riot, the rebellion started, she got off of work that day early, and she came and got me from preschool. And then she went to Quitman Street School and got my brother. And she told us, don't go out. Don't unlock the door. And my brother climbed on the kitchen chair and he unlocked the door. And she asked who unlocked the door. And she tore us behind up. But I remember from the riot was there were stores all up and down Springfield Avenue. We didn't have to go downtown to shop. And we didn't have to go, and then like, in, um, they didn't allow us to pass the border up in Irvington. We couldn't go to Irvington. But we had everything that we needed in our community. And there were stores all on Prince Street. And um, I remember from the ride was the army tanks, the police, and you could smell the, smell the smoke, and you could hear the, um, the gunshots at night and my mother she walked the floor all night long and when we went to church on Sunday there were uh, military police outside of, outside of our churches guarding us you know as we went into church and coming out of church and the riot the um, the rebellion it really messed up a lot of things for us because we had to go downtown then to shop we had to go on the highway and it really messed up a lot of things. And then, thank God for Mayor Gibson. He came in and he straightened out a lot of stuff and various politicians that we had then because it was really hard for the poor people to, to make it. But we made it with the help of the Lord. And I'm 40, no, I'm 52 now, but I was three years old when the riot was. And... We look at North now, they trying to rebuild it, but it's not the same because what they put in here is 
you know, it's not like it was. We had we had butchers, we had furniture stores, all types of clothing stores on Springfield Avenue, furniture stores, and we could find whatever we needed for our homes and stuff, and, and our parents could find the clothes that they needed for us to wear to school and stuff like that. And now you have to go on the highways to shop, and you have to go out further to get what you have to get. So I encourage everyone, when the election times come, to get out and to vote in the general election. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. I see, I will call you next. I see Councilwoman Mildred Crump here from the city council. Come on over and say a few words, Councilwoman Mildred Crump, the president. She's still the president? Yes. <laughs> I actually remember as though it was yesterday. Um, first, let me thank Pop for keeping traditions alive. You know, so often we want to forget our history. Uh, that should never, ever be the case. Uh, we need to be reminded of where we were, where we are, and where we've gone back to uh, in, in the history of this city. I was driving down Elizabeth Avenue trying to get to my apartment, 455. And as I turned the corner, there was this uh, tank with, with guns sticking out bigger than I was. Yep. Um, I worked for the state, and I had a car with no air conditioning, but no radio, Larry. Uh -huh. So I didn't know what was happening. I saw people running and carrying on. So finally, um, they allowed me to turn. Uh, I was afraid. They allowed me to turn onto Elizabeth Avenue so I could get home. They literally followed me. I mean, the guns were taller than Ingrid, uh, sticking out. Uh, when I pulled up to 455 and went in the garage, um, it, I discovered it was one of the sites where the uh, armed guards were being housed. Uh, it, it broke my heart. Um, and But I disagree with one thing that was said, Larry, and that is, what was, was for then. And what Newark is now is for us. Uh, we need to hang on to the past, but always be positive about the future. So thank you so much for, um, I, I need my pop shirt. I can't, somebody stole it. I told Ingrid, <laughs> I told Ingrid the other day, give me a, a new shirt. I grew out of it and I put it someplace. But thank you all for remembering racism is evil. It's more than evil. Uh, it, it's, it's consuming. Um, and so on behalf of my colleagues and the, uh, the great mayor of this city, uh, thank you for um, commemorating uh, an incident that changed the life in the city of Newark. Thank you. Give my hand, Councilwoman Trump. Madam? Just real brief, uh, my name is Roberta Singletary, I'm a retiree of the North Public Schools. At the time of the riots, we lived at Springfield and Jacob Street, uh, right around the corner from the Old Fields Department Store. And I remember my mother coming back in the house saying, I can't go to work today. There's tanks coming up Springfield Avenue. And at that time, Deluxe Topper was a huge employer, and they would send a bus for their workers at Springfield Avenue and 10th Street. She said, I can't go and leave my babies. There's tanks coming up the street there. And uh, from the time where we went to uh, South 10th Street School, which is not Harry Tubman, but we were bused to Abington Avenue. Uh -huh. And so we had gotten the notice that we couldn't cross the North Avenue. So many days we didn't go to school. We just simply couldn't go to school. And I just remember that like it is just burned in my brain. I'll never forget it to come out to Springfield and Jacob and to see the tanks coming was just something that was unreal. And I just wanted to share that moment with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call Richard Camareri, who was in Newark and was 
old enough to know what was going on in 1967. Richard Camarero. Thank you, Jimo. Uh, yeah, I'm old enough to know. <laughs> 49 years is a long time. I guess I was 14. Um, my family was a little ways away on Bruce Street between Cabinet and 12th Avenue. Um, and uh, it was uh, a very, um, it was a time of British Burma. And as most people know, historically, the 60s, um, anti-war movement, counterculture, uh, growing awareness of black nationalism in the north, um, but all of it rooted in the the insane um, infection of racism that this country was built upon, that we all know about. Um, it's remarkable to me, you know, people talk about Dallas, and uh, while things are not the same, as the preachers would say, we're not where we were, we're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, you look what happened in Dallas, and it's like, inconceivable that people don't get the concept of we reap what we sow eventually right that some individual will become so enraged and justifiably so at the amount of, of police officers who do the wrong thing who kill people and deranged enough to think that murdering cops is going to be payback I mean it just there is a certain logic to it but it doesn't make sense strategically it doesn't make sense morally the key is we got to get you know, we, we try to do the right thing. Anti-violence, I tell people, you know, you hear often, well, I don't need black people doing nothing about people killing people in their neighborhoods. I said, well, that shows you don't know what you're talking about. Right. New York has an anti-violence coalition that's been doing this for 10 years. Yeah. Every week they've been demonstrating. So we're taking care of our neighborhoods. But it's also the police. And, you know, I know a lot of cops, the majority want to do the right thing. But it's those ones who don't that passed, cast a pall upon the entire thing. And how often do we see these videos? There was one recently about a cop who punched out, it was a black cop, who punched out a drunk woman, yes, right? Yeah. You see that on Facebook? Yes. And, and when you look around at these, that may be one bad cop, but he was surrounded by two or three others who didn't do a thing, didn't say anything. I mean, it's on, it's on the police too to call out their own who are doing the wrong thing. Right. Um, I say all I'd say, this is all connected. What happened in Newark in 67 was a result of years of disinvestment from our from our city. I mean, you most talked about that eloquently. You know, things did, it's just like a bunch of colored people went crazy and started burning shit down. I'm sorry, pardon my French. This is about years of disinvestment based on federal government policies, private policies. And if you think it's wrong, then go to Ironbound. You know, I take people on tours and I say, you see what in Ironbound? That's what the Central Ward used to look like. It did. But because of the disinvestment that was racially targeted, our central ward blew up. Parts of our west ward and south wards blew up. And so it gets frustrating. You know, they come here year after year, but we have to, to honor the memory of the dead. And these are people, you know, how can you hear people, the 27 people who lost their lives? No, they didn't lose their lives. They were murdered. They were murdered by law enforcement. That's the reality of it. And the fact is that the first two days of the North Rebellion, no one was killed. That's right. Not one person was killed. It's only when the state police and the National Guard came in that people started dying. Right. So that, so some people say there were two uh, so-called riots the first two days, but then there was a law enforcement riot the next three days, right. where they started just killing people all over the place, and for nothing, for no good reason. You know, capital offense is not stealing a case of beer, and that's what some people got shot down for. So, so we're here, I'm here again, I will keep coming as long as I'm alive to honor the memory of the people who fought and struggled in Newark, because this is my home. I've been here since, well, I ain't been here since 1899, but my, my mother's father got here in 1899. Some people think I've been here since 1899, but that's not true. Um, and this is about our humanity. I don't care what color you are, what race, sexuality, you know, all that stuff. This is about our humanity. It diminishes us as individual human beings to look around and see this kind of nonsense in our country, the kind of racism kind of oppression, the kind of retrograde capitalism that keeps us all down. It's about us to keep struggling. And I stay, I stay, I keep hope alive. You know, at the march yesterday, yeah. I saw a lot of people I hadn't seen before, a lot of younger people too, which is encouraging. But, you know, we have to, you know, some of us, we have to pass the torch. And so, you know, we, we keep things alive. We keep our hope alive because things, there are enough people who have the right thing in mind who know we have to change the system for the better. So, I mean, I just, 
constantly have to commend my brother here, because he is indefatigable in terms of People's Organization for Progress and his work, and everyone here. You like that, Milton? Yeah. Uh, so again, thank you for um, humbly accepting the honor of speaking, and thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Who else residents? Come on, Joyce. Hi, my name is Gloria Cruz, and Glorious, and I'm not a resident anymore. I'm a resident of East Orange. But in 1967, I was married to my husband. He was in Vietnam. He wow. called me from Vietnam, concerned about my well-being. I've actually known a lot of people that are on there, and I've been a part of Newark all of my life. Newark is, will always be a part of my life. And I just want to say, I brought my grandson from Cincinnati because I wanted him to be a part and to witness how we can come together. I'm a little disappointed that there aren't more people out here, but I could only count on myself. So I brought myself, my husband, and my grandson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else from Newark? Forrest Drummond and then Barbara King. Forrest. Yeah. I'm Forrest Drennan. I went to high school with Larry here. And uh, I was living here in uh, Newark at the time of the uh, 67th riots. I had a summer job. I, uh, uh, and on the 13th of, uh, of uh, July, I got on a nine Clifton bus and rode across here early in the morning. Wow. And I saw all these people running across, yeah, the Nine Clifton, running across the street, running around. There were no police, there was no, uh, there was no National Guard, there was nothing. The, the bus driver was, looked, looked amazed. I was standing there staring out just like I did when I rode the ferry over to New York past the World Trade Center after 9-11. So, um, you know, these, those are some traumatic experiences in my, in my life, things I'll never forget, things that, that won't make, I mean, that, that's going to make a difference. I try to teach my nieces and my nephews and all of the younger people that, you know, ha, ha, that, that, uh, about what's going on because they need to know. They need to know because no change will happen as long as we, we remain uh, um, docile. Right. We must organize. Right. We must get it together. That's we right. must teach our children. Right. We must get our education. We must get jobs. We must make jobs. Yes. And this is what's what, what's going to have, have to happen. Thank you very much. Very good. That's my classmate from Arts High School. <laughs> All right. Well, she next and then you. And Brad, I got you. Yeah. What's up? Power to, the people. Power, to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. I want to first again thank um, the Chairman Larry Hamm and the People's Organization for Progress for consistently working on behalf of the people and have this memorial. This memorial is very uh, touchy, sentimental for me. When the rebellion broke out, I lived in Hayes Home Projects on 17th Avenue. Now people that I went to, I had just graduated from high school, and people that I have went to high school with, knew their parents, all kinds of things. The rebellion didn't just kill Miss Spellman on, um, in the projects. She lived on the 12th floor. They killed her in front of her children, children who I knew all the members of the family. It didn't just kill them there. It helped destroy part of their family. Because some of the children that was affected by it, seeing their mother shot and killed, things didn't go right for them. And of course, you know, in this community, they bring drugs just like in every other urban community. So things was going wrong and we knew what was happening. As it was mentioned earlier, by me living on 17th Avenue, across the street from the 4th Precinct, seeing exactly what goes on, up and down that street and all around, as a young woman, I did see the police, the National Guard, riding with their shotguns, pointed at us like, if you dare move, you're out too. Just like the nine-year-old boy 
putting garbage out, shot and killed. And we must always remember them. And that's why for those who continue the struggle, some people say, why do you still do that? Or oh, Larry Ham still marching and all these different things. For those who struggle, for those who struggle for us, to live for us, like Amiri Baraka, Mina Baraka, the yes. Committee for a Unified yes. Now North, we can never forget that. But we can never forget the people, the mother of 12 children, blown away because they were just shooting any and every type of way. So I just want to thank you so much again. And I said, and also, instead of us just thanking him, we need to recommit ourselves to making a change in our community. Yes, we have elected officials, and I appreciate, number one, our mayor, who I think is the best mayor for us, and our council president, who have shown, just like she's here today, always out there. But we need to, if you're not, as you, I know you heard Brother Larry talk about, if you're not in an organization, join one. But I can honestly say that one of the most progressive organizations here in the city of North is run by Larry Ham, the People's Organization for Progress. So thank you. Even if he has a few or hundreds, he still is committed to this change, just like Martin Luther King, just like Malcolm, just like Harriet Tubman, Stephen Biko. People all over the world have always been struggling. And we must really, if we're serious, it doesn't matter if you're well known or not, everybody can do something like Martin Luther King said, if you're a, sweep, a street sweeper, sweep it, be the best right. that you can. Uh -huh. So right. if you for change for making this world a better place, right. if you make it better in Newark, help make it better, and you help make this state better, and you help make this uh, nation better, we can help make the world better. So at least we can say, it may not have been big what I've done, but in the name of our ancestors who struggled, black, brown, white, all of that, who struggled to make a better world, I was a part of it. And that's a blessing from God. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Barbara King. Yeah. Sir. All right, how you? Introduce yourself. Okay. Good afternoon, my community members. My name is John Knight. Uh, I've been living in Newark all my life. Uh, what I want to say is, in my time when I was young, after the riots, during the riots, the unity in our community used to be so fantastic. It was a time when you can walk down the block and you taking a tray of food to someone that was your neighbor, or you're, you're, you're helping your elder up in the house with no problem. Okay, our, our unity factor has fallen. It has fallen to a, 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 a low of like, I just can't explain how it makes me feel. The losses of the families that has lost the children that have gotten shot and so forth and so on. What I want to say mostly is, Newark is a very, very beautiful and powerful city. We have beautiful things going on up in here, but the lack that we are lacking is the community unity. We need to regain our community unity. We need to pass a plate to someone when they need it. We need to loan a dime if someone needs it. Yeah. We stop. We need to stop put, looking down our nose at those that are struggling and suffering. Okay, our babies, our babies are not learning what they're supposed to learn. At a time when I would walk down the street, if someone heard me cuss, I would get a behind whooping from the neighbor. They would call my neighbor and walk me home, and my mother would whoop my behind again. Discipline was key. Okay, community was key. How, how is it today that? No one wants to give a man a sandwich. How is it today that you don't want to say hello? That's Common right. courtesy costs you nothing. Right. Staying as a unit, we can build and strengthen ourselves back in our community. North is a place to which everyone came through. People grew, businesses grew, okay? Shake a hand, give a hug, say hello, feed someone. Let them know that North is still what North used to be. I remember walking down here and you can smell Sunday dinner going through every hood, every hood. My, my sister here, that's my elder, I would help her with her bags and didn't ask for a quarter because it was necessary. It was something that you were supposed to do to help your people. Okay, I'm not trying to like, uh, you know, like 
keep the eye off the other people. But right now, my heart is heavy for the loss of the families. We lost beautiful people, beautiful people. And it seems like someone will speak today and he'll forget about it tomorrow. This has to go on forever and ever. We must maintain the factor of bringing ourselves together and rebuilding our community. We are a people. We should stay as a one. And that's all I need to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Brad, you were here in 1967. Somebody, Daniel, hold that for Brad so he can say a few words. Yeah, I was here in 1967. In our communities, it was everybody sticking together. Always in our community. And I found out later on, when, when they said there's a rebellion, a riot, they said it was a riot in North. And I went around with my friends, and the, the schools were closed. So I went around to my, my house. I couldn't go out, but I went out anyway against my parents' <laughs> voice. And then I seen the Army people, National Guardsmen, going to everybody's house looking for something. I didn't know that because I was younger then. I was about in the seventh grade or sixth grade. And then I found out after going through all that, they were um, going to everybody's house, knocking on their doors. And then I found out when I seen him in the, in the alleyway, I, he had a gun out. So he ran back there in the yard where I was at. And he said, this is it, young man. I said, this is it what? What is it? This is it. You had no business being out here. Close your eyes. Close my eyes for what? This is me talking. So then I said, then I called out to somebody. Then his sergeant came in down the alleyway and said, what's going on here? I said, this man is talking about shooting me with an M M14. So, so I'm looking at him, and he, he said, no, you go ahead and mind your business. And, and I said, when I got home, I told my parents about it. I, so I knew about people suing people. I'm, a, I'm ready to sue him. <laughs> I'm ready to sue him, because he tried to kill me. This is what he was serious about. That's a serious issue. And I looked at it from another perspective, I said, I gotta let this go. I gotta, I gotta try to make it do better. My father was a Korean vet. And he said, he called around to his friends cause he had worked that um, morning and he, they wouldn't tell him nothing. They let me go and, and didn't tell my parents nothing but he followed me as I went, went to my house. What is he trying to do to me? Trying to give me a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. All the time. All right, Brad. Are there any other Newark residents or people who are residents doing, that were here? 67 anybody else I was a resident here in 1967 I am a child of the Central Ward many people don't know I grew up right here at Ridgewood and Avon number five Ridgewood Avenue Mildred I lived next door to the Ridgewood bar and across the street from Esther's restaurant Y'all wouldn't believe this, but I used to sell watermelons right here on Belmont Avenue. No, this is true. Yes. Don't act like you don't like watermelons. We love watermelons. People made a living selling watermelons. My, I used to work for a man named Jay Hughes. He sold watermelon in the summertime and coal in the wintertime. We used to sit the truck right here in front of Hayes Homes in front of West Kenny and Belmont Avenue. I could still smell the hay. The truck was filled with hay 
because the watermelon would roll around, and if you didn't have any hay down there, the watermelon would break. And people would call out the window. They wanted watermelon. My job, the watermelon big as I was, I had to take watermelon up to the 13th floor of Hayes Home. And I did that for a few summers and then left there and went to South 12th Street. And it was on the night of July 12th, 1967. I was at a party. Yeah, remember red light parties? You used to take out the white light bulb and put the red light bulb in. I was at a red light party at my friend Willie C. house. Willie C. lived across the street. And somebody ran upstairs and said, Springfield Avenue is on fire. And everybody that was at the party ran downstairs. My mother was right on the porch waiting for me to come out. Get your butt upstairs. You're not going down the street. And I'm glad she did because I went down there and got killed. That's Well, maybe not the first night because Richard is telling the truth. Nobody got killed the first. In fact, the thing was kind of calming down till they called in the National Guard. That's when everything got upset again. And the other thing was that a lot of the stores that were black owned, they wrote Soul Brother on the store. And then the state troopers, when they came in, they shot out the windows of the stores that had the Soul Brother on. I remember when the half tracks, they weren't full tanks. A half track is like a small tank. The half tracks were coming up 16th Avenue and they made a, a military post right at the intersection of 16th Avenue and 12th Street. When they declared martial law, we couldn't leave our house. There was a good deal on the corner of South 10th Street and Springfield Avenue. Couldn't go to the good deal, couldn't go nowhere. And Brad mentioned how the National Guard was going door to door looking for what they call contraband. That was stolen goods. They came into my house. And then when martial law was lifted and we could leave the house, they searched the car. They had cordoned off 12th Street. They had a post at one end and a post at the other. So you couldn't get in and out of 12th Street without your car being searched. And that's the way it was. So. It was a military occupation, and that's why we call it a rebellion. And I remember when I finally could come down Springfield Avenue, you could smell the burning in the air. The burning was over, but you still smelled it. There was glass everywhere. The streets were full of glass. And you know these things that they pulled down over the stores? They didn't exist before 67. These, these gratings, they didn't exist before 67. There was two kinds of gratings. The first gratings they pulled down, you could see through them. They was like rolling by, but I guess that wasn't enough. They had to get them kind of gratings over there where you, it's really a metal wall pulling down. And it took time for the city to get back on its feet, but it did get back on its feet. And we elected Mayor Gibson in 1970. But, but before I finish, I need to say this city owes a debt of gratitude to the great freedom fighter, militant writer and poet, Amiri Baraka. His contributions must never be forgotten. Where Forrest? Did Forrest leave? Forrest. You remember? When 502 High Street, uh, Committee for Unified Newark was at 502, Baraka's headquarters was on 502. So those of us that went to Arts High School, if we took the 25 or the number one bus, we had to get off of Springfield and it, what was it called then? High Street. Now it's Martin Luther King. But you couldn't go to school without passing, without passing 502 High Street. That was Baraka's headquarters. The brothers would be standing out there and we would pass and they would say Habadi Ghani. And we didn't know what that meant. So we call them the Habadi Ghani people. <laughs> you know? But later on, we, we remembered, we learned, we didn't remember, we learned that that was Swahili and that was a greeting. And um, my contact with Amiri Baraka changed the course of my life. 
the, the trajectory just went left. <laughs> it's been going left ever since. Two, two men affected my development. Well, actually more than those two, but my political development. Ken Gibson that appointed me to the Board of Education and Amiri Baraka that raised my political consciousness. Now, I was conscious of being black before I met Baraka, but I didn't have revolutionary consciousness until I met Amiri Baraka. See, it's not, a just, it's not enough to just know you black. You got to know we got to change this situation. And it was Amiri Baraka that breathed the spirit of revolution into me. He's the first one that I ever met in person that talked about the need for revolution. Is there any other person? I'm going to ask Brother Zaid Muhammad to come over here and then maybe we'll close out. Brother Zaid Muhammad, come on over and make some remarks. Give him a big hand from yes. Brother Zaid Muhammad. Give him a hand. Shout it out. Community unity. Let's Com bring it back. Unity in the community. That's right. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. I'm not going to talk long. I'm actually going to do something very esque that I found just a couple days ago. Y'all see this poster? Yeah. Out of the blood and ashes of the Newark Rebellion came some revolutionary organizing. They came out of this town and went all over the country. Young folks, black power was not a slogan. It was the organizing agenda of the day that changed the day. So these lives that were lost on those days, those lives were not in vain. And if you can see, there's a bandage on the right side of Amity's head. He got that right here on Springfield Avenue from the police, right. from somebody he went to school with. Isn't that something? That's right. Yo, let him tell it. He used to tell us all the time how that went down. That's John Smith. Yeah, this is the cab driver that was savagely pulled out of his cab by the police and then beat nearly to death. And word that got out that he was beaten to death, folks went off. They said, that's it. And of course, y'all remember this picture. This is the picture that went all over this country when this young boy got shot in the head. And he, by the grace of the God of our ancestors, he survived. He survived this. Yeah, it didn't hit him squarely, but, it, but the impact, of course, knocked him off his feet. And it look, looks bad. Getting shot is a mess, and I say that by virtue of having bullet holes in my body. All right? So let me do this, though. I'm going to just do this. Hold it. Let's take that. I found something that I wrote 30 years ago for the North Rebellion. It's a, it's, a, it's a people's children's pro, pro, uh, poem. And I wrote it for a little girl named Lauren Walker. Her mother was in a, a writing organization with me at the time called the North Writers Collective. It's called Baptism in Rebellion Through the Eyes of a Child. Some of y'all will remember this from back then. Mommy, they breaking windows! Ooh, they bad! Ooh, mommy, look at all the toys and clothes and TVs and stuff they taking. Oh, those boys stealing, mommy? Right. Mommy, mommy, why are those red lights on those cop cars so loud for, mommy? Somebody in trouble. Hi, mommy. Ooh, 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 mommy, look over there. They start to pit fire, mommy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mommy, look, the cops, they got their guns out. Wow. Are they shooting for real with real bullets? Mommy. Cops bust that man in his head, bust his head open, and it's bleeding. Mommy, they throw that lady on the ground, and they kicking her on her back and all her stomach, mommy. Mommy, they hurt, they hurt her real bad, and she wasn't even doing nothing. Mommy, why we walking so fast for her, mommy, mommy? Mommy, they shot that boy. Look at all that blood coming out of his leg. Oh, mommy, they shot another man. The ladies with that man called him all kind of names. And she say bad words, too. I'm coming, mommy. I'm coming. Ma mommy, you ain't saying excuse me when you hiccup. Why are you holding your side? Mommy. Mommy, what's the matter? Why you fall down on the ground? Mommy? 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 You bleed? Mommy? Wake up! They shot my mommy! I hate cops! Those lives 
was not in vain. Carry on, or carry on the tradition. We got to stop police brutality on these streets right now. When we see these federal monitors over these pigs right here, I said pigs, because that's how they've been acting. The ACLU did the documentation, 96 pages of pig filthy behavior. We got them on their best behavior now by virtue of this protest that we do in the streets holding down these traditions. All right? And we got to continue to do that. We got to keep that honest. We got, we got to, when we go into court, to fight for that civilian review board, we got to make the state respect this. Right? right? We got to make that happen. And let, as we were the example, coming out of the North Rebellion, with all that revolutionary organizing under the imamu, we need to be the example again and help these cities all around the country do the same thing. It's time, the time has come to stop police brutality in our community. The time has come. Stop police brutality. Stop it. I can't hear y'all. What's wrong with y'all? Stop, stop, stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. Stop police brutality. By any means. 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 Time has come. See the time. See in the world. Bring back the union to the community. Yes, sir. Thank you. Give Brother Zaid a big hand. And the last person we're going to hear is Brother Ian Burroughs. Brother Ian, did you want to say something? Brother Ian is a Bales bondsman, y'all. And he's seen... Oh, Reverend Rowtree. You didn't raise your hand. I kept saying, is anybody else? I'm waiting on you. No, come on, brother. She'll close us out. Make your noise, big brother. Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Ian. I own all USA Bell Bonds, which is only a block up the street across the street from, from the movie theater. Um, I've been black my whole life. Amen. <laughs> you know, I do have friends who are in law enforcement as well. I mean, I know this is my feeling of the situation. It's the image that's been presented is what some people are fearful of, to include ourselves. The image that is presented scares some people. Not giving nobody a pass on how these things go, but the image, we have to be responsible for our image as well, all right? Now, I know, looking around here, we have our white brothers and sisters, native brothers and sisters, Latino brothers and sisters as well. So it's not just black versus white, it is wrong versus right. Yeah. Right, right. And we right. need to understand that. Yeah. Right. See, I try to do my part. I see the young brothers and sisters up here, and I ask them, like, we have to talk to them. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? What, and what are you trying to do? We can't be afraid to talk to each other and then expect somebody else who's not part of the community to not be afraid to talk to us as well. But we're afraid to do that ourselves. We have to do a little bit more of that, hands on. Myself and a lot of the brothers of the Masonic Lodge in this, in this city, we have committed ourselves to come out here and be more visible and get out here and be involved and talk to our youth. Participate, not just charity, but like stop, spend some time, because the most valuable thing that we have to offer is our time. Oh yeah. The most valuable thing. Yes. So, I am here for the revolution. All right. I will be part of it. If anybody who is participating in the revolution by happenstance ends up locked up, Brother Ham calls me and I'm coming to get you. All right. All right. All right. All right. We all have our parts in this revolution. That will be my one of my parts, one of my many. All right? All right. So that's pretty much what I have to say, Brother Ham. All right. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Rev well, Reverend Roundtree, you're going to close us out. Anybody from Newark Anti-Violent Coalition? Yep. Go speak. Oh, wait, or... No? What about my queen right here? I see Reverend Roundtree. I said she's going to close us out. I just want to make sure. Brother Enoch, did you want to say anything from Zulu Nation? All right. Zulu. Come on now. You got to walk faster than that. <laughs> we got bad love for the Zulu Nation. Bad love. Hey, thank you, everybody. Peace. Peace. Power to the people. Power to the people. Um, 
I can't remember the last time I spoke at this uh, at this um, anniversary for the rebellion. But I can tell you this much: the last time I spoke, it was a much smaller crowd, and I was telling Miss Sandra in the back earlier that this this right here is, is starting to come out and develop even more. Seeing the youth out here earlier and helping them beautify the, this little area, it was a beautiful thing to see that and 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 to see the momentum build up and having all the attention from the cars, the buses, and all. I feel that that you know what's happening now in our society. It's uh, it's 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 needed that we be more involved in what's going on in our communities. It's needed that more that we advocate more of this type of history within our community. We push it into our schools. We push it into the minds of our youth. Because this right here needs to be remembered. It was a fight that we still continue today to fight. It was it was a sad, sad but strong point in our history here in the city of Newark. And I wasn't alive during the rebellion, but my family was here. My uncle Ramon Rodriguez, who um, was a part of the Young Lords in the in the later 70s, he he often told me of. Uh, his little insight of what it was like during the rebellion while he was out here as a, as a young as a young boy as well and how he how he um would <laughs> would leave the house even though my grandmother would tell him he needed to stay indoors he didn't care he felt there was a greater purpose to be involved with our community you know and, and, and the background was the, the Puerto Rican community over in the North Ward he was actually central because we lived in Sussex Ave, the family at the time. Uh, so his, his reason for leaving the house while these tanks were driving up and down these streets and, 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 and the military state troopers walking around, his reason was to make sure that our community was safe. That's right. and, and, you know, just hearing about that story, you know, when I was younger, it, it, it kind of instilled something inside of me. And it reminded me what that was when I heard each and every one of your stories here today, um, the sacrifice, the sacrifice without, you know, it's not about caring about your own will, it's about caring about everybody else's and making sure that everybody was okay. And, and he put his neck out there to definitely make it to these people to make sure that everybody was safe, the family was okay, their friends were in line and that nobody was trying to get caught up in the mess out here. And today's different. Ooh. Oh, oh man. Sorry, that kind of got me right there. There's an accident. Yeah, just happened. Real quick. Um, I see. Right, I'll go. I keep on. I keep on. Just you know, have a couple of heads go check and make sure they're okay. Um, I'll just tell you like this. Uh, it's important that we, as a people, come together, black, browns, and whites, um, all, all races of people come together and be there for each other. This right here happened right now, this simple episode right now, seeing our people come out there to be there for them, that's, that right there is a part of the mission. That's important. That's a very key, important thing, to be witnessed and to be active at the scene of something that happened. Let it be our people that be there for them. Let it be our people who's policing that. Make sure that our people is making sure that they're okay. And that's what's important. And 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 to me, um, as a Boricua, as half Ecuadorian, as, as, as part native, you know, it's something that I try to spread amongst my people is unity. Unity and strength in numbers. And, and, and to definitely come together with our black brothers and sisters and, and to make this a, a strong united front is one of the most important things that I try to push out there. And, and this right here is it's an honor for me to once again be here, a part of this um, anniversary for the rebellion here in Newark and to um, stand amongst those that were here as well during those days, it's an honor. And I appreciate it. I thank the People's Organization for Progress. 
I, I show love to the North Anti-Violence Coalition. I represent the Lost Tribe Zulus here in New Jersey. And get involved, people. Spread the message. Get involved. We need more of our people involved. We need to make sure that most of our people is out here in the front lines pushing the strong message, positive and, 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 and progressive message out there. Peace to everybody. Peace. Peace, brother. Brother Enoch. Thank you. I see um, my sister, Reverend Roundtree, is going to close us out. She's coming back now, and then we'll all go in peace. <laughs> Reverend Roundtree. Power to the people! 1967, 49 years ago, lives were lost. 1967, livelihoods were shut down. 1967, children were just shattered. Their memories, their dreams, their hopes, their families, marriages torn apart, houses broken. 1967. 1967, I was a very, very little girl, but when I used to look out my mother's window, that was the Cougar Scout Mansion on High Street, it was like watching a movie to me. Wow. It, it just looked so unreal to see, because you don't see, children were not used to seeing, little children in North were not used to in 1967. I know racism existed, I know about the Imperiali days and heard about all of that, but to look out your window and see people in, army uniform, uh, the fatigues and, and all of these things. It just didn't look real. And my mother would be like, get away from the window, get away from the window. But my window at the mansion was like two blocks from the street. But she was still in fear because bullets fly. And when they start hitting windows, we lost a mother of 11 children. When they started hitting our young people, we lost some fathers, we lost some potential doctors, we lost, we lost a lot. But thank God, here we are in 2016. Amen. Thank God for Larry Ham, right. Adibu. Thank God for the training. Thank God for Barbara King. Thank God for sure for Imamu Amiri Baraka. When I used to walk down High Street, I wanted an Afro and a dashiki so bad. Right. Didn't even know what it represented, but I wanted it. Right. Thank God for NABC, yeah. because these are the organizations that stand strong now, that 1967 should not and will not, with the help of God and us, be repeated. Right. We gotta stay on the wall. There's a scripture, Nehemiah 4 and 6, and they talk of the model I, I use this, this, I've been using it now for a couple of years, that in 52 days, they built a wall. But everybody didn't stay there to build a wall. But Nehemiah got that wall built in 52 days. We've got to be Nehemiah models and stay on the wall. If Larry Ham has two, if Larry Ham has 200, if Larry Ham has 2,000, NABC is recruiting, Larry Ham, I know you are going to recruiting. We can never have enough. We can. We need to start training our youth. Shame on us. Shame on us. Shame on me for not sharing the history. Our children today are coming up thinking that they're entitled. That's what we have, a generation of entitlement. You're supposed to buy me sneakers. You're supposed to. You, you, pose, you pose to do all of this. When I was young, I had to work for But at the end of the day, who's teaching them how to go out and do for themselves? That's right. That's right. Rather than depend on what these corners are going to give them, which is just death or jail. We got to start sharing with our babies. I see them. I'm out here. Y'all lived it. I'm now seeing the end, the NABC seeing the end. We see the babies out here with the blood running out their mouth on the ground where their 17 year old friend done shot them or somebody. We see, we look firsthand. Just the other day, a two year old baby was left on a corner of South Orange Avenue and Bergen Street after her fa his father was shot. Whoever took the father's car left the baby 
on the street, took the baby out of the car, left him on the street. They turned the baby into the hospital. We don't know who brought the baby. Oh, the police got that. But we got to be more conscious of our... We talk about the rebellion. We talk about 67. Now we got to do something about our own. And what's going on in our community. That's what we got to do. I applaud you and I commend you, sir. Because I know you've been on this wall a long, long time. And don't nobody else say nothing. This man is talking. And I thank God for our mayor because I got a whole lot of revolutionary up in me now. Thanks be to God. I was all this sophisticated. Well, I won't say sophisticated because I always was a little thug in me. I got a little thug for sure. But it's not the thug, bad thug part. It's I got some heart. Okay, and I got courage, and I will go up against you if you're not right. Thanks be to God, in a right way with love. But I'm not even concerned anymore about what people think about what I say. It does not matter, because I don't want the blood on my hands. So, Larry Ann, thank you, Adiba, for giving me this opportunity. Thank all of you who stand behind him. NADC, I'm a proud member of, by the way. I'm, and my dues are paid. I'm a proud member. I love it, love it, love it. Um, Dawn, I see Street Council, I see our president, Lady Keisha, um, there, there's uh, my brother, right? Oh, you see an ABC, right? I don't have to call a name. God knows you right here. So now if you wanted me to just close out with a blessing on this day, Sister Barbara, can we do something? Can we just, and I, I just suggest my, I don't care who's surrounding me, Malkia, can y'all just come and just grab a hand or touch somebody? Just, just let this unity flow. Yes. Yes. Touch somebody. Touch somebody. As we circle the memory of those. Oh my God. Mm. It could have been any of us that have lived long enough to even be able to tell the story. It could have been our parents. We could be telling a different story. Um, but let us just bow our heads for a moment. Most gracious and everlasting God, we come to you today. Lord, in all our sadness for our people and all of the actions that we take, God, trying to do the right thing for our people, we ask right now, God, that you just help us to continue to raise the consciousness of our people, God. We ask right now that you bless each one in this circle. We ask right now that the People's Organization for Progress be continued to be covered, strengthened, God. We ask that you cover its leader, God. Give him what he needs to go forward. Build him up where he's torn down. Strengthen him on every side, God. And those that stand with him, we pray that same prayer. And then, God, every organization here represented, we ask right now that you keep your loving arms of protection around them. We need a spirit, God, a spirit of, and I won't say revolution alone, God, but we need a spirit of love, a spirit of concern, a spirit of caring. And, God, most of all, don't ever let us forget to share, God, the history. Don't ever let us stop talking to the people about what did happen so they can be prepared and have their minds made up to do what they need to do as they go forward in this fight, God. Yes, it's a fight, and you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind and the power of love. So right now, God, we are not scared because you're preparing us for whatever we have to deal with. We thank you right now for all that you've already allowed us to do. We thank you for bringing all of us here this far just by our faith and commitment. So God, since you brought us all the way through these 49 years, those that you're going to carry on, those who have yet to be born, we ask right now that you cover them, cover these streets, God. Dry up the blood, God. Right now, keep our babies, God. Right now, help their minds, God. Right now, heart fix a mind regulator. Right now, God, we cannot do it without you. But our minds have to be right. Our hearts have to be focused. Our ears have to stop taking in garbage. Our eyes have to stop looking in the wrong places. Help us in this generation right here. In this year, 2016, I declare and decree in the name of our God that we're going to go forward and go forward strong. There will be no police brutality without us taking a stand. Our babies will not be killed without justification. There will not be no type of situations that we won't stand strong, flat-footed, and come up against them in the name of our God. We trust you, oh God. We thank you, oh God. We pray for any of those families that are still amongst us, Lord, that were affected by this, and those right
right even on this day that are affected by the senseless violence all over this country. Now, God, I ask that you bless each family represented here, that you cover them from the top of their heads to the sole of their feet, that when they go to their homes, that your spirit will permeate through their doorways, that when they walk on the other side of the door, that they will have peace that surpasses all understanding. And when they walk up and down the highway, God, when they're driving up and down the highway, God, that you will go before them and protect them and their families now. God, I ask as I close this prayer that you cover this city, cover the administration while you're covering the mayor and his family, while you're covering the municipal council and their families while you're covering every employee throughout the state city county and country and world we ask right now god this circle right here that you're being us to strengthen us and since you're already here god we ask that you go before us to guide us and that you be beneath us to support us keep your angels encamped over us as a shelter we'll be careful not to take credit for anything good that you've done or made it possible for us to do but say thank you, thank you. we accomplished it in the name of our God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Allah, we have prayed. And everyone in agreement with me said, Amen. 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 Amen.